Okay, good afternoon once again. We are still on law of contract. Today we are going to talk about another important aspect of law of contract, and that is vitiating factors. You remember when we were talking about valid contract? We said that there are certain factors that can affect the validity of contract. And there are those we call vitiating factors. They make the contract invalid. So the vitiating factors will either make the contract void or voidable, or even unenforceable. So we have learned that one. So by the time we finish with today's lesson, you should be able to define what vitiating factors. When you say vitiating factors, what are they? What is the vitiating factor? They should be able to measure four ways by which a contract may be vitiated, may be weakened. Then you should be able to explain this mistake, misrepresentation, duress, and undue influence. Now let's start. So what is when you say vitiating factors? What is it? I've already told you what vitiating factors are. So I said they are the factors which can invalidate a contract. They will make a contract invalid. When they are present. They will make a contract invalid. They can make their contract void. They can make their contract voidable. They can make their contract unenforceable. So they weaken the validity of their contract. So that is what vitiating factors are all about. Remember, we learned about genuineness of consent. So when these vitiating factors come in, then there will be no genuineness of consent, and therefore there can never be a contract. So now we are going to pick them one after the other. So we are looking at ways by which a contract may be vitiated. We are looking at four main ways which we have already talked about. Mistake, duress, undue influence, and misrepresentation. Mistake, misrepresentation, duress, and undue influence. So what is a mistake? We have learned about what mistake is. Now, if you, are, if you make a mistake, means there is an error. So in law, when we say mistake, we are looking at fundamental error. That is made by a party or both. Either one of the parties will make that error or that mistake, or both parties can make mistake. So that is that. So it's a fundamental error. That is made, we said it's fundamental because you see, they usually make the mistake at the initial stage of the contract. At the beginning, whilst they were entering the contract, they make mistake. So that is that. Now, let's look at situations under which mistakes can occur in law. Situations under which mistakes can occur in law. Number one. There can be mistake about the terms of the contract. They can make mistake about the terms of the contract. Now we know what the terms of the contract are. When we talk about the terms, when you enter into contract, a contract is based on terms. The person says you have to pay 500 Ghana CDs a month. You stay in the house for two, two years, so you are paying 500 times 24. You are paying that. You'll be the one to do this. I'll do that. These are the terms of their contract. And they can, the parties can make mistakes when they are preparing the terms of their contract. So that's number one. Another situation mistake can also occur is about the identity of the contracting parties. Mistake about the identity of the contracting parties. And that is what we call mistake of identity. What does that mean? This is what it means. There is somebody called X who wants to enter into contract with Y. But by the time you realize that X had rather entered into a contract with Z. So there is a mistake of identity. There is a mistake of identity. When you are entering the contract, you should know the person you are entering into a contract with, so that in the event of breach, you know the one to seal. And you can make mistake 
about the identity of their person. Let me give you an example. Your father may even want a, 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 somebody to teach you business management. Your father comes to school and wants to see a particular business management. Then somebody can say that he is that person. So your father may enter into a contract with that person instead of at the, pe the person that your father wanted to enter into contract with. When that happens, there is a mistake of identity. And when there is a mistake of identity, that means there is no contract. The contract is void. So if the person even starts teaching you, and your father, that there is no contract between the person and your father because they have a mistake of identity. And so the, the, that contract is void. It's, there is no contract between your father and the person. So if the, the person teaches you, your father refuses to pay, there is nothing the person can do. So there can be mistake of identity. There can be mistake of identity. Then, another area that mistake can also occur is about the existence of the subject matter. The parties may make mistake about the existence of the subject matter. If I want to sell a car to you, the subject matter is the car. Now, the two of us can make mistake about its existence. I may have a car, then I've written for C on the car. You also know that I have a car. But we, and we are both at the same place, the same town. Then probably I traveled somewhere, let's say, to Accra, and I met you there. And said, you were interested in buying my car. I said, okay. How much? Is it uh, 50,000 Ghana cities? Now, the two of us have entered into agreement in Accra. The car was not there. We were both thinking that the car existed. That was the thinking. That was the assumption. The reason why you are buying the car is that you assume the car exists. I also assumed the car existed. Now, but you see, it may happen that by the time I left where I was to Accra, when I was even on my way, somebody might have stolen the car. So, as at the time we were even negotiating, the car was not in existence. Or the car might have been bent down. Or somebody might have picked the car and the car is now involved in accident and the car is not in the state you saw at first. So you see, we entered into the contract thinking that the car existed. I thought the car existed. You also thought the car existed. Now that the car wasn't even existing at the time we even entered into the contract, we made the mistake in respect of the existence of the subject matter. So these are three areas mistake can arise in contract. Mistake about the terms of contract, mistake about the identity of the contracting party, and then mistake about the existence of the subject matter. So that is for that one. Now let's look at mistake about the existence of, uh, about the identity of the contracting party, a case to support that. Mistake about the identity of contracting party. Whom are you entering to contract with? And there's a case, Burton versus Jones. Burton versus Jones in 1857. In 1857. When did Ghana become independent. 1957, so 100 years, 100 years after this is Ghana became independent. Burton versus James. Let me give you the overview of the case, the summary of the case. Now, remember, this is the plaintiff and this is the defendant. So this was the one who went to court. Now, the defendant sent an offer to somebody we call Brockelhurst. In Brockelhurst shop. So Brockelhurst had a shop. And the defendant, Jones, sent an order to him that he was buying items from him. Not knowing that by the time Jones sent the, of the, the order to that shop, which belonged to Brockinghouse, Brockinghouse had already sold the store to Burton. 
So Brocky, Jones intended to buy the goods from Brocky House. But the order came to Bunting, who supplied the goods. You, are you getting it? So it was not meant for Bunting. It was meant for Brocky House. But Brocky House had already sold the store, the shop, to Bunting. And Bunting got it, something that he wants to order from Brocky House. Then you accepted it. And supply the goods. So when it came that he should pay them, and he said he wouldn't, he would not pay because he did not intend ordering the goods from him. And that is why Bolton sued him for his money. So what happened in court? Bolton lost the case. Why? They said the contract he was not the one that Jones wanted to contract with. He accepted an offer which was not meant for him and he supplied the goods and if he had taken the goods and used the goods then uh, there was no contract between the two of them and therefore he was not going to pay that money what even convinced the court was that you see Jones told the court that Brockingham was owing him so he was going to use the goods that he took from Brockhouse to offset that money. Do you understand it? Yes. Brockhouse was owing me. So when I said the order, I was, if he had supplied the goods, I would have told him, please, my money is with you. Use the, that money to pay for what I, I came to buy. So that is this case. That is this case. I'm repeating, Jones sent a letter to Brockham House. Brockham House. Now, uh, in Brockham House shop to buy goods. But then, but then the shop had been sold to Bolton, who got the order and supply. Jones used the goods and said he wouldn't pay. Because he did not intend contracting with Bolton. And he won the case. Bolton was the one who sent the case to court. He lost it. Because it was like X wanted to enter into contract with Y, and Z has accepted it. <laughs> he did not intend contracting with you, but with Y, and you have accepted it. So that is that is. You are finding it difficult. You, you don't understand why you did not pay. That is what law is. So you should be very careful. Law, that's why at somewhere along the line, to you, law is not about morality. He has used the group, but he did not pay. Simply because of this mistake of identity. It has made their contract void as if there was no contract between the two of them. So that's what that. Now let's look at types of mistakes. Types of mistakes. Number one, we have mistake of law, and then we have mistake of fact, or operative mistake. Mistake of fact is the same as operative mistake. So we have two main types of mistake. Either it is mistake of law, or operative mistake, or mistake of fact. So operative mistake and mistake of fact, they are the same. Now what is mistake of law? Mistake of law is when, for example, you enter uh, somebody's garage thinking that a particular car, look at it, I said thinking, thinking that a particular car is brand new. Then you offer to buy the car because you thought it was brand new. Later you find out that it was not brand new. You have made a mistake and it's called mistake of law. And it doesn't affect the validity of the contract. The contract is still valid. The person will not give your money to you. And you cannot take that any legal action against the person. So that is the mistake of law. When it comes to mistake of fact or operative mistake, we have two types. So number one, we have what you call bilateral mistake. Then we have unilateral mistake. Under mistake of fact or operative mistake, we have bilateral mistake and unilateral mistake. By by, you know by means two. Uni means one. So bilateral mistake means both parties have made mistake. 
Now remember, there was when we came here, I said mistake about the existence of the subject matter. Both of them made mistake. Both of them thought the car existed. So both of them made mistake. So there are certain times both parties can make mistake. But there are other times it's only one of the parties that had made a mistake. And when one, it is only one party that had made mistake, the other party should be aware that the, that party has made mistake and they should make their contract void. So mistake will make a contract void. But when you come to bilateral mistake, where both parties have made mistake, we have two types of bilateral mistake. Either it is common mistake or mutual mistake. So bilateral mistake can be common mistake or mutual mistake. Common, mutual. When you say the mistake is common, it means they both, both of them have made the same mistake. Both of them have made the same mistake. Like this one. Both of them thought the car existed. So they have both made the same mistake. That is what we call common mistake. But when they make different mistakes, then it means it is called mutual mistake. And that one, we are going to use a case to support that. Raffles versus Will Chehos. And come closer. Raffles versus Will Chehos in 1864. Raffles versus Will Chehos in 1854. Now, what is the, this case about? In India, Bombay, Bombay in India. There were two ships. You know ships have names. And the two ships bore the same name. The name was Peerless. So there was one ship called Peerless. The another ship coincidentally was also called Peerless. So what happened was, was that the defendant ordered for bales of cotton through a ship called PLS. So he knew, he knew he was ordering for the cotton, bale of cotton from a ship called PLS. And he knew that that ship was sailing in October. So in October, the ship would bring the bale of cotton. Not knowing or unknown him, there were two ships. One was called, uh, that one was called PLS, but that one was sailing in December. He was ordering for the cotton via the ship that was sailing in October. The plenty, those who were sailing the ship, no, the uh, cotton. They also thought that they were uh, bringing the cotton via PLS that was sailing in December. So when the October ship came, he went for the cotton, and there was no cotton. December, that PLS came. Then he did, he refused to take the cotton that came, and they sued him. The cotton came via the PLS which came in December. That was the time those who were bringing the cotton, they intended bringing it. He also thought that he was ordering it via this one. So you see there is a mistake, there is fundamental error. Both of them have made different mistakes. One was thinking that the uh, it was coming in October, another one was taking that in December. And once there was this fundamental mistake, there was no contract between the parties. And therefore, the court said if his refusal to take the curtain was not a breach or was not in breach of a contract, he had the right to say he would not take it because there was a fundamental error, fundamental mistake. So that was what happened in Raffles versus Wichibos. Now let's move to misrepresentation. 
What is misrepresentation? In law, representation means statement. When you are entering to contract with people, you make statements. Is that not it? How can you enter into contract without a statement? And the statement is what we call the terms of the contract. Now, somebody can make a statement that is not true. The person may make a false statement. And that false statement will induce you to enter into a contract. For example, the person was selling a car to you. The car wasn't a brand new car, but this person said it was a brand new car. And it looked like a brand new car. But the person, they have used their car. But the person lied to you. Now, if the person lied to you, because representation, representation is a statement. When you add the miss, then it becomes a false statement. So, misrepresentation is a false statement that is made by a party to the contract which induces the other party to enter into a contract with him. Now, he said the car was brand new, so that induces you to enter into a contract with him to buy the car. So later, if you find out that the car was not a brand new car, what do you do? You can rescind from the contract. You can repudiate from the contract. You can redraw from the contract. So, whereas mistake who made the contract, Void misrepresentation who made their contract voidable, and we know what is a voidable contract. Voidable contract means that you have the right to rescind. But remember, in voidable contract, so long as you have not rescinded, the contract is still valid. So that is for that one. Now, let's look at we have two types of misrepresentation either it is innocent misrepresentation or fraudulent misrepresentation. Get closer, innocent. Like you say, somebody is not guilty, the person is innocent. Then fraudulent, fraud, fraud. Now, what is innocent misrepresentation? Innocent misrepresentation is where the person who made the false statement didn't know that the statement he was making was false. That is it. Okay, if I have given my phone to you to sell for me, I did not tell the phone was brand by you. You look at it, you thought that it was brand new. So the person you were sending the phone to, you told the person it was brand new phone. In fact, you did not intend to deceive the person. You didn't know that the phone was not brand new. You thought it was brand new. So that one, you have already you have made false statement all right, but it is called innocent misrepresentation. If you had known, you wouldn't have made that statement. You were reckless. You, you, if you had also said for you, have also known. Now, when we make that misrepresentation, what will be the remedy available to the injured party? In law, when you say remedy, it means if somebody breaches a contract, what can you do? If you are going to court, you will go to court to seek for remedy. So, when somebody makes that, Innocent misrepresentation. What are the remedies? Very simple. So remedies for. Uh, okay, let me. Uh, I've talked about this. The innocent one. So let me look at the remedy for innocent misrepresentation before, before we come to fraud. Man. Number one, you can sue the person. Okay, let me be systematic. And so if I've talked about the innocent. Let me talk about the fraud. Man before we look at this one. So what is fraud then? If the OPSI, after the fraud then, you knew that the statement you were making was false. So you, didn't, you intended to deceive the person. And so that is fraud then. So now, when it is fraud then, what are the remedies available to the person? What can the person do? Number one, the person can sue you for damages. The person can sue you for damages. So the key here is damages. You understand sue, to sue somebody. So you go to court for damages. What is it? Now you see, because the person made that false statement, you must have lost something. You must have lost a, a certain amount of money because of his false statement. So, see, for damages means that you go to court and ask the court to ask the person to pay you money for the loss that you incurred as a result of the person's false statement. So, you can sue the person for damages. We shall learn damages later.
Number two, you can repudiate or cancel the contract. So if one the person has made false statements, either you if, if you think that you have lost something as a result of his misrepresentation, you can do or sue the person for damages. Or you can cancel the contract. You can cancel it. Number three, you can refuse to perform your obligation under the contract. So these are the three remedies available to the injured party when the misrepresentation is fraudulent. But when it is innocent misrepresentation, the remedies, number one, you see here you can see for damages, but if it is innocent, you cannot see for damages. You can only rescind. Like here, the two, these two is the same thing here. But this one can is not here. So you cannot sue the person for damage, but you can rescind. You can withdraw from the contract. But if the court thinks that the person had uh, the person gave that false statement and it, it has it made you lose something, and the court wants to uh, give you some damages, then that one is the court's decision. You cannot sue for damages. But the court may look at the extent of the misrepresentation and then decide that if there is any damages to be given to you, then the, if I say the court will give this, that means that the court is the one that is going to give money to you. They will ask the person to pay damage. You are, you are not the one who sealed the person for damages, but the court can order the person to give you damages. But here you yourself can seal for damages. Then the third one here, the third one, you can decide that. Remember here, we said you can rescind. But if you don't want to rescind, you can decide to affirm the contract. If, if you affirm it, it means you said, even though you have made false statement, I will still, I still like the contract. So let the contract exist. So you affirm the contract and perform under it. So these are the remedies for that one. Now let's go to duress, which is also another one. We have already explained to what is the rest. Now, you see, when you are entering to a contract, your free will, nobody has any right to force you, to threaten you to enter into a contract. You have to enter into a contract by your own accord, by your free will. But if somebody makes you enter into a contract as a result of a threat, then it means there is the rest. If the person forces you, if the person threatens you, and the threat can cause harm to you. And as a result of the threat, you enter into a contract with the person. It means you enter into a contract under duress. And when you enter into a contract under duress, if somebody threatens you to enter into a contract with him, you have a house, the person says, if you don't sell the house to me, I'll kill you. If you don't have this, the, and the person has the ability to do that. Please know that the threat is not just the person saying that I will kill you. The court will want to find whether the person is capable of carrying out that threat. Whether that threat is going to cause badly harm to you or whatever it might be. Then the moment it is determined like that, then it is duress. And if you want to rescind, you can rescind. Duress, we have already learned that it will make a contract void double. It doesn't make the contract void. So if there is duress and you have sold your heart to somebody who threatened you, who threatened you, and you wait, then later the person will go and sell the house to another person. By the time the person will sell the house to that person, there was a valid contract between the two of you. And if you allow the person to transfer to another person, you may not have it. So once it is the rest and you want to rescind, rescind within a reasonable time because it is not void, it is voidable. So that is for the rest. So I said the rest is wrongful act of threat of one person that induces another person to enter into a contract against his or her will. So it is the person threatens you to enter into a contract against your will. The a case to support that. Can they see it? Yes. Is it visible? Words, Mrs. Words, words versus cheese man. This cheese man was living with this woman called Mrs. World. And Mrs. World had a house. The cheese man threatened 
this woman that if he doesn't sell the house to him, he will kill the woman. So out of that threat, the woman sold the house to cheese man for 300 pounds. Meanwhile, the value of the house was 3,000 pounds. But as a result of the threat, he sold the house to the woman. Later, the man died. But fortunately for the woman, the man hadn't sold the house. The man had transferred the house to the wife. So the woman sued and he won the case. He won the case because he, she sold the house because of the threat. So the contract was voidable and he rescind, she rescinded. And the court said she had the right to rescind. So that was what happened in this case. The last thing we are considering is undue influence. Don't forget that we are talking about the vitiating factors. And the vitiating factors, we have looked at mistake. We have looked at mistake. And the mistake, we talk about types of mistake. We have looked at misrepresentation. We have talked about types of mis misrepresentation and then the remedies. We have also just talked about duress. We are moving to the last one, undue influence. What is undue influence? Very simple. Now, when you uh, misuse your position of power, your position of confidence, your position of trust, so mis it involves misuse of position of power, position of trust, position of confidence, misuse. When, because you have authority, you misuse that authority to uh, let somebody, to induce somebody to enter into a contract with you. That is undue influence. So uh, misuse of position of trust, misuse of position of power, misuse of position of confidence. You, you take advantage of somebody of your position. You took advantage of your position. Because you are the teacher, you took advantage of that and entered into a contract with a student. Because you are the doctor, you took advantage and entered into a contract with your patient. Because you are a lawyer, you took advantage and entered into a contract with your client. You, that is misuse of your position to enter into a contract with somebody. A lawyer, somebody goes to the lawyer and then the lawyer can uh, add the first, oh, you have a piece of land, please. Uh, will you sell the land to me and so and so forth? The person, the lawyer is not threatening you. But you see, the relationship, a lawyer and then the uh, client, a parent and then a child, a teacher and a student, a doctor and a patient, the, the law will say that the other party was induced. There was some. Uh, inducement. That is why the person entered. For example, if a, if a teacher, you are afraid that the teacher may punish you. If a, a doctor, you, may, you are afraid that the doctor may not give you the right diagnosis. If you, it is a, your lawyer, you may think that your lawyer, if you don't say to the lawyer, the lawyer may not do the right thing for you, and so on and so forth. So that is number one. Number two. Number two, it involves dominion of one person to overcome the will of another. Dominion of one person to overcome the will of another. So you are the one at the top. You have a higher authority. So you dominate the person. And as a result of that, you enter into a contract with the person. Number three, you take advantage of somebody's weakness of mind. A drunk. A drunk. A dr or a drunkard. You enter into a person. At that point in time, the person was weak in respect of his mind. If you take advantage of somebody's weakness of mind, if you take advantage of the fact that somebody was in distressed situation, if you take advantage of somebody's necessity, then it is undue influence. So in undue influence, you overcome the will. The will of the person is overcome by inducement, not by threat. That's the difference between undue influence and then the rest. Undue influence, the person's will is overcome by 
inducement, not by threat. By indirect, it is by threat. So that is the difference. Now, in summary, when we say and difference, we are looking at where two people who do not have equal bargaining strength. The teacher and the student do not have equal bargaining strength. The lawyer and the client do not have equal bargaining strength. The patient and the doctor do not have equal bargaining strength. The parent and the child do not have equal bargaining strength. So, uh, when two parties who do not have equal bargaining strength enter into a contract, for example, teacher and the student, parents and children, doctor and patient, lawyer and client, and so on and so forth. So, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of vitiating factors. Remember, we said that vitiating factors, they invalidate a contract, they make a contract invalid, weaken the validity of a contract. And we have talked about the ways by which a contract may be vitiated by mistake, by misrepresentation, by duress, and by undue influence. We have talked about the fact that the misrepresentation. Mis mistake will make a contract void. Misrepresentation will make it voidable. Duress will make it voidable. And due influence will make it voidable. We have talked extensively of what uh, and due influence is all about. And we sum everything up. So now let's look at what we have here. Define uh, what the sitting factors are. Number two, mention number two, mention four ways by which a contract may be vitiated. Explain this. Explain this. Mistake, misrepresentation, duress, and until influence. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, this is where we draw the curtains for today's lesson. Yours is to study your material. You know, I've given you uh, soft copies of your of uh, the law of contract. Study it. When you come to school, you get your book. Now, I'll be giving you the wasi uh, question, the aspects that you should be able to answer. Now, even though you are in form one, you have just completed your first semester, if you come for second semester, I went through the objectives and you should be able to answer 26 of them. I have circled those ones. I will scan and put on the platform. Answer those questions and bring to school. Then the theory, I've indicated, I've put on the platform already, the, some questions you can answer. The question two, for example, I indicated that the question two, you should be able to answer question two, and then in full A and B, the case study, you should be able to answer the A, which was six months, the B, which was nine months, and then uh, as for the other one, you haven't done age, uh, insurance, so you will not know the principle they validated. And then the fourth question two, you cannot answer because you have not done that one. So that one too, know that you should be able to answer, you do that, and then submit the work when school reopens. Till we meet again another time, we will still be continuing with our, the topic uh, law of contract. We look at discharge of contract, the way by which a contract may be discharged. Till we meet again another time, it's bye-bye.